We, uh, we're back to our series in the book of Joshua. If you would turn with me over to the book of Joshua. Now, as we begin to, to move through the latter part of this book, we're not going to be going verse by verse as we have been because, uh, frankly, there's just some parts of it that uh, I would just be reading to you uh, land boundaries, and, uh, <laughs> and they are important in the context of how you study it, but, uh, but for the, the sermons that I want to bring, not all of them uh, have uh, really a, a meaty text uh, for preaching, some good in-depth study and uh, some good things to, to learn and know. But today, I want us to, to look at Joshua chapter 14. And uh, we're actually going to be looking, we'll start over about verse 6 this morning. And uh, I, want to, uh, I want to talk about a man named Caleb. Uh, Joshua gets talked about a lot, and Caleb sometimes doesn't get as much mention as he ought to, but there are some very interesting things that the Word of God has to say about Caleb that serve as a inspiration and a motivation for you and I when it comes to, to serving God. Uh, Caleb, you'll remember, was there. He was a part of Israel when they left Egypt. If you remember all the way back when uh, God sent Moses to deliver Israel out of Egypt, Caleb was there. He's been there all along. He was there when God divided the waters of the Red Sea uh, to provide the way for their salvation from Pharaoh when he drowned Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea. Caleb was there. He witnessed that. And we remember that as we study that, that that's a picture of our salvation when God led us out of our Egypt and out of our bondage of sin. Uh, and here we find that as we observe Israel, as they journey uh, through the wilderness, uh, that Caleb was there. He witnessed it all. He was, uh, he was a part of Israel. And, uh, and we, uh, we have studied this in previous days, in previous sermons, that, that God had a land that was flowing with milk and honey, that He had prepared for Israel, uh, and, uh, and He wanted them to possess it. Uh, and it would be a land, though, that would have its battles. But nonetheless, God had promised that it would be Israel's land if they wanted it. Uh, and as you know, because you've been here for the series and you've heard the sermons, hopefully, you know that Israel instead chose to wander in the wilderness because of their unbelief. Thankfully, there were two individuals that did not demonstrate unbelief, but instead they had great faith in God and a great God, and those two individuals were Joshua and Caleb, and this morning we're going to talk about Caleb. You see, as we study this book, we know that it is a picture of the Christian life, that God saves us, and when He saves us, He promises us that we too can have a life of victory, that we can have a life of intense spiritual joy, but oftentimes, rather than claiming what is ours, the things like peace and joy and fellowship and power and uh, the glory of God, many people choose to do like Israel did, and they wander in a spiritual wilderness. They wander there defeated and depressed. But this morning I want to tell you that, that the reason that happens is that because many Christians are guilty of doing what I call spiritual window shopping. Now, nothing wrong with window shopping. In fact, it can save a lot of money, and a lot of folks like to do it, if you're not male, that is, like to window shop. Uh, it's kind of like the one man that asked his wife, he said, why do you even call it shopping? You never buy anything. And She turned to him, and she said, why do you call it fishing? You never catch anything. And so many people do lots of spiritual window shopping. And as Christians, we need to do more than just window shop with God's promises. We need to begin to appropriate them. And we find in Caleb a man who did just that. And so this morning I want us to see what it is that enabled now an 85-year-old gray-headed man to possess that which God had promised him Years prior, Caleb pictures for us the Christian who is willing to pay the price, 
who is willing to fight the battles and win the victory that God has waiting for them. In these verses, we are given or shown how we can claim our part of Canaan. And our part of Canaan is victory. Victory in our life. We can have victory in our spiritual life. And so this morning, we're going to look at this gray-haired conqueror. If you would, stand with me, and let's read a few of these verses, and then I want to go back and highlight them. Begin with me, if you would, this morning in verse 6. It says, Then the children of Judah came to Joshua in Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephani, the Kizanite, said to him, You know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. He, he said, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea, to spy out the land, and I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed my God, the Lord my God. So Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he has said these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses, while Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now here I am, this day, 85 years old. As yet I am as strong as the day as on the day that Moses sent me, just as my strength was then, so now is my strength. How would you like to be 85 and say you're just as strong as you was the day you were 40? So now is my strength for war, both for going out and for coming in. Now therefore give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. For you heard in that day how the, how the Anakim were there and that the cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me, and I shall abide to drive them out, as the Lord said. And Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron to Caleb as an inheritance. Hebron, therefore, became the inheritance of Caleb because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that, Lord, this morning that you would let Lord, these scriptures serve as a, Lord, a, a challenge and an inspiration. Lord, to get rid of the half-hearted commitments. Lord, to claim all of the promises that you have so richly blessed us with. We pray, God, that you would find us, Lord, more deeply, Lord, committed than ever before. I believe that these are dark days. I believe that that, Lord, that these are the times, Lord, where, Lord, you are separating, beginning to separate the sheep from the goats. And, Lord, it's time, Lord, for folks to decide which side of the fence they're on. Lord, let those decisions, Lord, be real for some, for all here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. The first thing that I want to talk about, there's four or five things that come to mind in these scriptures. And the first thing that I want to talk about is Caleb's commitment. Commitment's something that people don't like to hear a lot about. In fact, we are living in a day where people are afraid to make commitments. Uh, they're afraid to make commitments to marriage, so they just move in and shack up together. People are afraid to make commitments to church, uh, so they uh, so they fail to volunteer for service or for duty. Uh, commitment is a, a scary thing to a lot of folks. But I'm here to tell you that it is one of the first keys that we find in the success of Caleb. That the fact is, is that Caleb was wholly committed to the Lord. If you look back at verse 8, verse 9, and verse 14, it says over and over again, that he wholly followed the Lord. Say that with me. He wholly followed the Lord. And what does that look like? What does that look like to you to wholly follow the Lord? Would that be a 
good description of your service to God that you wholly follow the Lord. It's interesting that the Bible would say this about a man. We would expect it to be said about Jesus Christ. We know that He did the will of the Father, that He wholly followed God, His Father. But here we find that Caleb is a, a man that did this, and in fact, we find six times in the Old Testament. And to wholly follow the Lord is a phrase that means to close the gap. It's the type of phrase that hunters use when they're closing the gap between themselves and their prey. It, it, uh, it, it refers to the fact that, that, that Caleb was committed to closing the distance between him and God. Now I want you to think about that for a minute. That phrase, to be wholly committed to the Lord, wholly following the Lord, when you break those words down in the original Hebrew, it means to close the gap. How many of you know we've got to work hard to constantly be closing the gap between us and God? I believe we've got an enemy, an adversary called the devil that's looking for every way in the world to put something between us and God. He's always trying to put a different commitment in the way. He's always trying to put a person in the way. He's trying to, to do something that will broaden that gap. But Caleb was successful in his life. He obtained his inheritance. He did the will of God. He possessed all that God had promised because he was successful at closing that gap. I want to ask you, have you given any thought about what distance there are in your life right now between you and God? Are you as close as you've always been? Are you walking as near His side as you did at one time? Can you still hear His voice when He speaks? Does His Spirit still stir you in your heart uh, when you sin? Are you convicted uh, when you, uh, when you uh, do less than His perfect will? How many of you know that those things are evidence of walking with the Lord? Those are things when your conscience bothers you. When your conscience stings you uh, over something that you do, that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. That means that God is still working on you. Amen? But we've got to close that gap because the farther we get away from God, the harder it is to hear Him. The more distance that get between us and God, the harder it is for us to, to feel the, 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 the conviction or, or the spearing of the Holy Spirit. So we find that he wholly followed the Lord. And what that means is, is that every inch of his life, every ounce, every nerve, every fiber of Caleb belonged to God. There are lots of people that think that, that yeah, that's a description of a preacher. That's a description of a Sunday school teacher, but not me, just an ordinary Christian. The fact is, is that nothing less will bring spiritual success in your life. Nothing else will ever bring that land of victory that you are looking for than to be wholly committed. read a story recently about Julius Caesar. Uh, when Julius Caesar landed on the shores of Britain with his Roman legions, he took a very bold and decisive step. He wanted to make sure that, that his military venture on the island was successful. And so he ordered his men to halt on the edge of the cliffs of Dover. And he commanded them to look down upon the waters below, the waters that they had just sailed across to get to this island. As they looked over the cliffs of Dover, to their amazement, every ship that they had just sailed on across the sea to that island was sitting there in the water burning. He had set every ship on fire. Why? What's the point? Caesar deliberately cut off any possibility of retreat. Any possibility. Now that his soldiers were unable to return to the continent, guess what? There was nothing left for them to do but to advance and to conquer, to have success and to achieve. Uh, and that's exactly what they did. You know the problem is with most Christians? Most Christians, when they come to Christ, always leave themselves an out. They always leave themselves a back door to slip back into the carnal life. Always leave themselves a, an option, a way out to, to not do what God had called them to do. There were three little girls that were talking about their dads, and one of them uh, could have been your little, one of your little girls, uh, maybe, but I hope not. 
One little girl said, well, she said, my father's a doctor uh, and he practices medicine. Another one said, my dad's an attorney and he practices law. Another little girl, she said, well, my dad's a Christian, but he don't practice anymore. It's descriptive of too many people that I know. I meet those folks every day. They claim to be Christian, but there's no practice in their life. There's no, they left themselves an out and a back door, and they're no longer following the Lord. You see, lots of people go to extravagant lengths to avoid doing what they promised the Lord that they will do. But I believe that this is not the day for half-hearted Christians, uh, for us to be faint-hearted. Uh, uh, we need to begin now to learn to conquer the giants in our life. Caleb was not afraid even at 85 years old. He said, I'm just as ready for the battle now as I was when I began. He said, I'm just as ready now to fight the fight than I was the day I began. But for far too many of us, uh, as the years wear on, as the battles uh, seem to just come one right after another, people get half-hearted and faint uh, and look for the back door. There was uh, 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 the story was told uh, of a man that, uh, who rode in his car as it was being towed up to be repaired. And uh, when they arrived at the repair shop, the tow truck driver, he said, you know, he said, that big hill really scared me. He said, I didn't think we was going to make it up it. And the man in that rode in the car on the way to the repair shop, he said, you think you were scared? He said, it scared me to death too. He said, I just knew we wasn't going to make it. He said, that's why I kept putting on the brakes. He said, I scared we were going to roll backwards. To live without de total dedication, to live without wholly following the Lord, is like trying to go forward while holding on the brake. It just don't work. The fact of the matter is, is that we've got to give it all to God if we're going to have any success in obtaining our promised land. You remember what James said? James said that a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Uh, and so we know that Jesus demands total surrender. In the book uh, called One Crowded Hour, Tim Bowden gave a description of an incident in uh, uh, Borneo in 1964. And these, uh, these particular fighters in this foreign country were asked to jump from airplanes into combat against the Indonesians. And, and the thing, that the quote that kind of stood out to me uh, about their commitment was is that when they were asked to jump from the planes, they said, well, our only request is, is that you'll fly over a swampy area and not fly more than 100 feet above the ground. And the guys that were enlisting them to fly the mission said, your parachutes won't open if we're only 100 feet above the ground. And the guys go, oh, we didn't know you was going to give us parachutes. How many of you know that's committed? Amen? That's committed when you're willing to jump from an airplane without a parachute. The fact of the matter is, is that's the same commitment that God calls us to. The fact is, is that we can't be looking for an option or an out. That we've got to give it all to God the way that this gray-haired old man did. He gave it all to God. Over and over, the Bible described him as one who wholly followed the Lord. Wholly followed the Lord. How many of you know that would be a great uh, inscription to have on your tombstone? Somebody else to say of you that you wholly followed the Lord. Spurgeon told about the deep love and devotion that French soldiers had for their leader, Napoleon. And uh, in one uh, story that he told, he noted uh, how that it was not an all unusual for a mortally wound, wounded soldier to, to raise up on one elbow and, and give a final cheer to the, to the revered general. And uh, just hoping that by chance that maybe uh, uh, he, would, uh, he would see the dying man uh, shouting his praises with his final breath. Uh, and, uh, and so... The fact of the matter is, is that he told about one man that was being cut on in the battlefield, removing a, a bullet from his chest, uh, and the, the dying man was heard to whisper, he said, if you go much deeper, doctor, he said, you're going to come to the emperor. The fact of the matter is, is that he had the emperor on his heart. Uh, if a man as notorious as Napoleon could be the object of such devotion in a dying hour, how much more does the King of Kings uh, deserve our undying devotion? So much so that if you cut any deeper, 
you would come to Jesus because we have Him in our heart. Amen? And so that's the, the type of man that we find that, that, uh, that Caleb was. Another man that in history that, that seemed to be that kind of man was D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody was saved at the age of 19. And uh, he, uh, he was saved under the preaching of, a, of an evangelist by the name of Henry Varley. And uh, one of the things that, that the man said, that Moody took, he said, that, he said, the world has yet to see what God can do in and through and with for a man who is wholly committed to the Lord. Do you know where God's still, God's still looking for somebody like that that's wholly committed just to see what He can do? D.L. Moody, if you don't know anything about him, was an uncultured, uneducated, untrained shoe salesman. But you know what? What you find in his life is, is that he was committed because he, he was used by God uh, to move two continents for Christ. Uh, he, he, he moved two continents for Christ. Uh, uh, just amazing the things that he did in his life. Uh, one preacher tells the story uh, 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 also of a, another commitment, and I've heard it different ways uh, about, uh, about this, but uh, the preacher told about in the, in the uh, Soviet Union how that they, they have secret house meetings there for church and how they can't just meet openly and how at one particular church meeting one night as the church was huddled in the house there were two God, two KGB men that bust through the doors of the house and what made me think of this was brother Jim Thompson's prayer in our prayer time this morning when he was thanking God for our freedom and that we have a free place to come and worship and not yet be persecuted but you better buckle your seat belts this is probably coming to a church near you but the fact of the matter is is two KGB officers bust in the door and uh, they tell everybody that they're under arrest put their hands up and they said they said uh, uh, right at this moment if you're not willing to die for your faith, if you're not willing to die for Christ, leave. Two and three and four and five people began to be ashamedly scurry out the door, scared for their life. Men and women standing with their children, with their hands up, not willing to move, still willing to die even for their faith. And then a couple more scramble out the door and some around the side and, and duck out every way can and before long there's probably only about half as many as were there at one time and then when everybody's gone the KGB officers shut the door and they said all right everybody put your hands down they said we're Christians too said we busted a home last week uh, and said while we were there to bust them for being Christians uh, we were converted and now we're believers too but this is a dangerous business and you can't have anybody that's half-hearted or we'll all get turned in the fact of the matter is this. The fact is, is that this is the day that we're living in where the, that we have got to be wholly following the Lord. Somebody say amen. And, and the, the fact is, is that uh, the days of half-heartedness have got to be gone because these are serious days where there's work to be done for the Lord. Also, another thing we find is Caleb's confidence. Look back in, in uh, chapter 14. And look there, uh, if you would, at about uh, uh, verse 12. And we find that, that he had lots of confidence. Uh, Caleb said, Therefore give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. For you have heard on that day how Anakim were there, and that the cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me, and I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. What is it that gave this 85-year-old man the idea that he could still kill giants? I want to tell you that Caleb had confidence, but he didn't just have confidence. He had faith in God's Word. God had already given the promise. He had already told them. You can look back in your Bibles at Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 34 through 36, and God had said this about the matter. And the Lord heard the voice of the words and his words wroth, and swear, saying, Surely there shall not one of these men of this evil generation see that good land which I swear to give unto your fathers. Save Caleb, he shall see it, and to him I will give the land that he hath trotted upon, and to his children, because, look, he hath wholly, he hath wholly followed the Lord. How many of you know Caleb had confidence that what God said he could deliver? Amen?
And so Caleb had seen the promised land, and for 45 years, he had that vision burned in his heart uh, as he wandered through the desert. As the other individuals were more moaning and whining and complaining like people do, that vision of what God had promised still burned in his heart. How many of you can just know that, that what we're going through here, we can be like those Israelites that died off in the desert. We can whine and we can complain and we can moan and groan and we can die in our desperation and our depression uh, or we can realize uh, that God has promised us uh, a victory. Amen? God has promised us uh, that even in the midst of our circumstances uh, that we can have joy unspeakable and full of glory. He has promised us that even if we live a, a ripe old age of 85 years here uh, and every day of it is filled with with hell that the first day uh, that we step on the streets of glory that it will all have been worth it amen that it half uh, has not entered into our minds uh, what God has in store for those that love the Lord Caleb kept that in his mind for 45 years it burned in his heart that God had made him a promise uh, and he was going to see it for himself you, I want you to understand some things that faith is not though Faith is not positive thinking. There are people that, that tell me all the time, I've got some buddies who say, say you, you ought to be more optimistic. You know what? I, I'm just a firm believer. If things can go wrong, they will. I'm sorry, it's my experience. If things can go wrong, generally they will. That has nothing to do with God. People say you ought to be more optimistic. But I'm going to tell you, positive thinking and optimism, that's not faith. The world thinks that's faith. They say you ought to have more faith. What is faith then? Faith is not looking at the bright side of things. Now listen to me. I like optimistic people. I like positive thinkers. I think there's some benefits to it, but don't confuse it with faith. That's not what faith is. You know what faith is? Faith is acting on what God has said. That's what faith is. Acting on what God has already said. You see, the fact is, is that you can't know what God said if you're not reading your Bible. You can't know what God promised about a particular circumstance if you're not going to His Word and seeing what He said and what His mind and His heart is. You want to be a person uh, that is uh, wholly committed to the Lord, wholly following the Lord? You want to be a person uh, uh, that, that has that kind of faith? First, you've got to know what God says about it. Amen? We know the Bible says that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. It takes faith to win spiritual ba battles. Uh, in fact, faith alone can give us the victory we seek. Uh, read your Bible. Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is and He is a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. Paul said, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats uh, because he does not eat from faith. Uh, for, for whatever is not from faith is sin. So what is faith? Faith is acting on what God has already said. That's what faith is. Faith is never just a blind leap. There's lots of people say, I'm living on faith. No, you're not. You're living on stupidity. The fact of the matter is, is that to live on faith, you live on what God has promised. You live on what God has said. What I mean by stupidity is this, uh, is that if you're not honoring God with your life, if you're not serving Him with your resources, if you're not a steward, uh, if you're not doing His will, you're not living on faith. You're living on ignorance. The fact of the matter is, is that Caleb had confidence in the Lord because he knew what God had said. Somebody say amen. It's why we study our Bible. It's why we go to fellowship and to preaching and to teaching. We want to know what God's mind is about things. Too many times we seek other people's advice. What do you think? What should I do? Why don't you go to the one who knows? Go to God. He has, he has a word of advice for you. He has a, a word of instruction. And He has your good in mind. The third thing is Caleb's courage. Caleb was a very courageous man. It, his commitment led to confidence and his confidence led to his courage. Three obstacles that Caleb had to overcome. If you go back to Numbers 13, 33, he had to overcome grasshoppers. If you go back there and read, he says, you know what? When I went in and spied that land, he said, 
he said, we look like grasshoppers in their eyes. And he said, in fact, in our own eyes, we look like grasshoppers. And so he had to overcome the grasshopper mentality to claim what God had promised them. You see, there's always going to be people that say, you can't, it can't be done uh, because it's never been done that way. You can't, we can't afford it or, or we, we shouldn't try it. Uh, it reminds me of the disciples when the 5,000 were following Jesus. And he said, he said yeah, we need some bread to feed these folks. Uh, and the disciples said, where are we going to get bread out here? And, uh, and he said, all we've got is, is this kid with a few loaves uh, of bread and a few fish. And Jesus feeds the 5,000 and they pick up 12 baskets after it's done. When God's in it, nothing's impossible. Amen? He had to overcome the giants there in Numbers 4. And you know what? All of us, all of us have giants in our lives. Some people have giants of a discouragement. Some people have giants that come in the way of finances. Some among us have giants that come in the way of sickness. And when you get the diagnosis like some of our loved ones have gotten in recent days, it must seem like a giant. Some of us face it in our families. Uh, how many of you know some of us have families that seem like giants? The obstacle seems like a giant when we have to deal with them. Don't anybody say amen. Just follow along. Some have it with depression. Some have it with doubt. But everyone has giants in their life uh, that if you, if you don't face them with faith, then they will defeat you. Here we find in Numbers 14.8, says, if the Lord delights in us, then He will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. How many of you know, if God says that, you can count on it. Amen? Now we say amen, we look at them and judge them, and we say, why couldn't they get it? They were such knuckleheads. Why can't we get it? We're such knuckleheads. We can look at it and say, look how small we are compared to these giants. But I'm reminded what Paul told Timothy. He said, for God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but He's given us a, a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. Amen? That's what God's given us. If God comes to you and He says, I've given you a spirit of power. I've given you a spirit of love. I've given you a spirit of sound mind. You know what we ought to say? We ought to say, I receive it in Jesus' name. I receive God's power. I receive His love. I receive the sound mind. Even though I feel like I'm going crazy, I receive the sound mind. In Jesus' name. How many of you know God has to honor His Word because He's not a man that He can lie? Amen? We look at those giants and what we ought to be saying is look how small they are compared to my God. Amen? Look how small they are compared to my God. The fact is, is that fighting giants is, is good for us. It's like eating spinach for pie pies. The fact is, is that it makes us stronger. It makes us stronger. This morning, none of us like to face giants, and none of us like to face those obstacles, but the fact is, is that we're card-carrying members of the human race, and we can learn from Caleb, from this old man, 85 years old, that we all have him in our life, and we can take courage in God's Word. And then finally, in verse 13 and 14, we see his, con his conquest. Caleb had finally experienced what God had promised. He climbed the mountains, he defeated the giants, and he claimed his possession. Now I want you to look. The name of the place that Caleb inherited was the name Hebron. You know what it means? It means fellowship. Caleb refused to quit until he had obtained everything the Lord had for him. He refused to stop until he had obtained that place of fellowship with God. My message this morning is this, is that we ought to wholly follow the Lord, and that means that we ought to close the gap so that we're in close fellowship with God. The place that, the place that, that, that Caleb obtained was fellowship with God. It was Hebron. This morning, what God wants us to know is, is that He wants us to be in close fellowship. My question is, are you still in close fellowship with God? Does your heart still burn the way it burned when you first got saved? 
Is there still a Pfizer? Is there still some coals there that, that the Holy Spirit can wave into a, a flaming fire again that you might serve Him with the zeal and the zest that you did when you first met Him? The fact is, is that's what we need in the church today. That's what we need in our hearts and our lives. And it ought to be our prayer. And it ought to be our battle to face the giants that are trying to get in the way of our fellowship with God. And the fact is, is that when we go out by faith and we face them and we take God's Word and His promises, that the end result is going to be a sweet, sweet fellowship with Jesus Christ. How many of you know that's a wonderful place to abide? When we're in that close communion, it feels so good when God doesn't have to hit us over the head to get our attention. But where we're still enough and attentive enough that when He speaks with that small, still voice, that we know it's God. Amen? We know it's God. You know what? That's where the victories come. Because then, God, that we don't have to wait till we get into the big, big decisions and the big battles to turn to God. Because you know what? God's gonna, He's going to lead us right where He wants us because we've been following Him every step of the way. He has our attention and we hear His voice. Caleb, he, he got what had been promised to him. And you know what's interesting is, is that once he got it, he could have said, okay, I did my part. And he could have said, I've been promised this land, and God, God can't lie, so I'm just going to sit back and cruise till He gives it to me. How many of you know Caleb? Now, that's not the way he lived, and it's not the way we're called to live. He knew there were still battles to be fought, and he knew if he went out in courage and confidence and commitment and did what God had called him to do, that God would give him the victory, but he had to get up, go out, and do it. Amen? And the same is with you and I. 